Well, if you'll turn this morning to the 7th chapter of the Revelation, and then put your finger in Matthew chapter 24. We've been looking at God's prophetic calendar in the midst of everything that you and I are experiencing in our world today, even in our own country, whether it's a concern about a pandemic and a microscopic virus, or whether it's the lawlessness and the riots going on and all the division going on with an election coming up and the political rhetoric that is going on almost unceasingly. It is absolutely imperative that you and I have a biblical perspective about everything that's going on. And most of us are becoming complacent. Have you gotten used to the new normal? So we just acquiesce to that. And we think, well, so-and-so has an answer and science has an answer. But never bother to consider the biblical perspective. And it ought to be exciting to all of us today. We live hunkered down in fear. And then we become indifferent and complacent. What does God have to say about all this? Remember we started by looking at the prophetic calendar of God. His timetable, not mine. And the next event on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And I'm not going back over all of that, folks. Except to remind everybody here this morning, the rapture is that moment when God is going to take His church, His bride, out of this world. And that's by invitation only. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you will not hear the trumpet. You will not hear the voice say, come up here. And once the church is removed... Then will begin that awful, horrible period that is known in Scripture as the tribulation. That's a seven-year period. And we've seen very carefully that that seven-year period is divided up into two sections, three and a half years and three and a half years. And we've been in the first three and a half in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. And then in Revelation chapter 6. And our Lord is reminding all of us as these things began to unfold. And, and again, we will, I won't be here. I hope you won't. But for those that are left behind, they will begin to see all of these things unfold. The birth pains. And those birth pains will begin to increase with a greater degree of frequency and intensity. And it does not take anybody with half a grain of sense today to look at what is happening even here in America and to know that we're seeing a dress rehearsal for what's going to be magnified many times over in that seven-year period, and yet we go right on our way. We've been seeing how the seals parallel with everything our Lord said in Matthew 24. When Jesus takes the scroll out of the right hand of God, the Father, and he begins to break those seals. And we've seen what each one of those seals broken will bring on this earth. We got through the sixth seal last week. When the great, uh, suddenly all of this being poured out, the wrath and the judgment of God falling on a Christ-rejecting humanity. And it's easy to get discouraged in all that, isn't it? Over in Psalm 103, and I, this is just not part of the text, I'll get to it. Over in Psalm 103, verse 19, this is what the psalmist has to say, and all of us need to remind ourselves of this. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over everything. He's in control of this, folks. You may not be. I certainly am not, but this much I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. God is in absolute total control of everything that's happening. And He wants to be in control of your life and my life. So over in Revelation chapter 6, we got to the breaking of the sixth seal. And let me remind you again what happened. There was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky 
fell to the earth and a fig tree, as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath is come and who's able to stand. Even those that are left behind that are lost without Christ recognize that everything that is happening in the heavens and on earth is from God. In fact, this is part of the wrath and the judgment of God being poured out on Christ rejecting humanity. Now there are seven seals this is the sixth one. And that parallels to what we see over in Matthew chapter 24, uh, beginning with verse 11. And then you come to verse 14 of Matthew 24. Now listen very carefully. This is the first half of the tribulation, the first three and a half years. We won't get to the second half until verse 15. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and the end, the end will come. So, six seals have been broken, and that brings you to Revelation chapter 7, and if you're just reading the Bible along, you would think all of this would be chronological and consecutively, but suddenly in chapter 7, there's a parenthesis. Now listen very carefully. God puts a parenthesis after chapter 6. And John records this. After this, after the breaking of the sixth seal, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four <coughs> angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Wow, what a statement. Oh, I know you flip and go back over to John, uh, Matthew 24 for a minute, verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony of all the nations and then the end will come. Now what's what's about to happen here in chapter 7, verse 4 of Revelation. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And he names the tribes. Sealed. What's happening? Again, this is a parenthesis. It's sort of like an interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. The first six seals are open as we've already seen in chapter six. The seventh seal is now going to be open in chapter eight and in between is chapter seven. Now, now listen to me, and I know sometimes this seems confusing. One, two, three, four, five, six seals are open. And if you think logically, then immediately the seventh seal ought to be open. But suddenly there is an interlude. There's a parenthesis before the seventh seal is open. And there's a reason for that. And that's why John is instructing us very carefully about what is going on. Now notice how chapter 6 ends. The great day of their wrath has come. Who's able to stand it? And I want to tell you this morning, folks, if you're sitting here and you miss the rapture and you think you're going to be the macho man and woman and you'll stand through all of this, you've got another thought coming. These are the great commanders and leaders of the whole earth, of the armies, and they're crying out, the great day of the wrath of God has come. Who's able to stand for that? under that? Well, the answer is nobody. They recognize that. But then all of a sudden, here's this interlude. 
And in this interlude, you and I are going to see God moving in mercy to do something. In the middle of wrath, we'll see God's mercy. The world, as someone said, at its worst, sees God at his best. After this, metatoto, after the breaking of the sixth seal, then suddenly John sees four angels. And sometimes we just sort of take this for granted or we just think this is uh, symbolism. Four angels, listen, who are standing at the four corners of the earth. We use that little phrase, don't we? Four corners of the earth. And they're holding back four winds. And again, God is sovereign. He's in control. These four angels are used by God to hold back for a while the impending further great day of his wrath being poured out. These first six seals are just the beginning of sorrows. And here are four angels holding back the four ends, the four winds. And when you work your way through scripture, angels in the Bible are associated with God's judgment always. And not always, a lot of times. Here in Revelation and in Psalm 78, 49, the psalmist declares the angels are the instruments of God's judgment. And now here they're holding back the four winds. They're at the four corners of the earth and they're holding back the four winds. Now, what does he mean by four corners? What would you find on a compass? Or you have a GPS in your car and it pops up. Map, what do you see? Ah, uh, there it is. North, south, east, west. These are directions. Directions. God is holding back these four winds, north, south, east, and west. And it is clear that these four winds are God's judgment. He stated that before in Daniel and in Hosea and in Jeremiah. One of the leading scientists that I quoted last week, Dr. Henry Mars, who is now dead, who, who created the Creation Institute, writes this, This verse has long been derided as reflecting a naive pre-scientific concept, conception of earth structure, one that supposedly viewed the earth as flat with four corners. That's not what he's talking about here. In terms of modern technology, it is essentially equivalent to what a mariner or geologist would call the four quadrants of the compass, north, south, east, west, or the four directions. And this is evident from the mention of the four winds, which in common usage would, of course, be the north, west, east, south, and, and, and west. These are the four angels. Now what's this? These four angels are holding the winds back. What a vivid picture this is. Now, folks, you think we got it bad right now? They're holding back the judgment of God so that the winds will not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. And that little word hold in the Greek means to have the power over something, to restrain something. These powerful four winds are already prepared and they are ready to blow. The judgment of God is about to become more intense. More intense. It's interesting when you, and a lot of people say you can't square science with scripture. And certainly the Bible doesn't speak to everything. But when it does speak, it never contradicts truth. And again, listen to Dr. Morris. The circulation of the atmosphere is a mighty engine driven by energy from the sun and from the earth's rotation. The tremendous powers involved in this operation become especially obvious when they are displayed in the form of great hurricanes 
and blizzards and tornadoes. These winds of the earth make life, make life possible on earth through the hydraulic cycle, transporting waters inland from the ocean with which to water the earth. And yet the angels, now watch this, four angels have turned off the gigantic engine. Oh, that's powerful. And then in verse 2, John said, I saw another angel coming up from the rising of the sun. This would be a fifth angel, and, and the little term rising of the sun always points what direction? East. East. Jesus is coming back through the eastern gate. This is a poetic way of saying the east. And this is the point of the compass where the sun rises. And from John's perspective, and remember he's on the Isle of Patmos, he's in exile, the land where God's promised salvation that came through Jesus the Messiah and where the 12 tribes of Israel came from, east. Now watch this, these members of these 12 tribes were about to be sealed by this angel. The fifth angel had a seal. And when that seal will be put on something, it will declare ownership. Do we not do that with cattle? We brand them. They did that with slaves in the, in the Roman Empire. They branded them. It also not only signifies ownership, but it also signifies protection. The angel is about to seal 144,000 people. Why is that? And there are 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, let's contrast that with another seal. And this is hot topic news today. Vaccine. Or a chip. What other seal are we running up on in the Revelation? Mark of the beast. And without the mark of the beast, you can't buy, you can't sell. And if you refuse to take it, you die. But in contrast to the mark of the beast, this is the seal of Almighty God. And he's using this fifth angel to seal 12,000 Jews out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Revelation chapter 14, John will describe the seal as the name of God, the Father, and the name of Christ. And the angel cries out to the four angels, Hold it back. Do not harm the earth and the sea and the trees until we have sealed the bond slaves of God on their foreheads. Now go back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The gospel will be preached throughout all of the world. Keep, keep all this in perspective. The church is not here. How are people going to be saved in the tribulation period? Church is gone. We've been carried up to heaven. And the Holy Spirit will not be operating in the same way that he operates now. In fact, the only thing that's holding back the Antichrist at this moment is the Holy Spirit living inside of you and me and corporately in the church at work in this world. How will people be saved in this seven-year period of tribulation? And John is about to tell us. The angel is about to seal 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Egypt, uh, of Israel, and judgment will be suspended until God has sealed them. Now, follow that timeline, folks. If the first 14 verses of Matthew 24 are in the first half of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, and that's where we are in Revelation chapter 6 with the breaking of the six seals, then the ceiling 
Of these 144,000, it's between the sixth and the seventh seal. On. The sovereignty of God. Four angels holding back the hydraulic engine. Don't harm the sea, don't harm the earth, don't harm the trees. Now, after the seals, well, we won't get all of these because we don't have time. But after the seals comes, seven seals come seven trumpets. And, what's, and that seven trumpet would put us in the second half. What is interesting, all three of these elements, the earth, the sea, and the trees, will be harmed with these trumpets. God in his mercy is extending grace to those that are left behind. And I'll clarify that in a moment. As one writer put it, since the seals do not especially affect sea or trees, it is safe to conclude that the command given in Revelation 7-3 is given just prior to the blowing of the first or the second trumpet. Who is to be sealed? Who are these people he's about to see? 12,000 Jews out of the 12 tribes of Israel. 144,000 Jews. Now there's some theologians that want to take this symbolic. Because one of the basic, the first basic rule of correctly interpreting scripture is to accept the literal meaning unless the context indicates otherwise. So why would I want to take 144,000 to be symbolic? And when the, when the scriptures are symbolic or they're using figurative language, that's not hard to interpret and understand, is it? When Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, he wasn't literally saying I'm a loaf of bread. Or I am the door. He wasn't saying, I'm literally a door. The context will tell us this is figurative language or it's symbolic, but unless it does, then you accept the literal meaning. And when John said 144,000 Jews will be sealed, I accept that as being literal. 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. One. Can't identify this with the church. We're not here. Can't identify this with Gentiles because Gentiles aren't Jews. And we'll twist and distort the scriptures. How in the world can you divide up the church into 12 tribes of Israel? It's impossible. The angel is very specific. I want you to seal 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And again, this is an absolute declaration that God is in total control. Mere random choice would not come up with such an even division. 12,000 out of the 12 tribes. I've mentioned it to this before, folks, and this is what would excite you if you stayed on an Israeli news site. The Jews, we don't see it from a Jewish perspective, most of us, because we have no concept of them being the chosen people of God. After 70 AD, all the genealogies were lost. But a, a, and a Jew takes great pride in his genealogy. What tribe am I from? What tribe am I from? Somebody was asking me the question of day about the temple in the millennium and the offering up of sacrifices, and that deals with the Jews. And only the high priest could offer up sacrifices. We don't know where all those people are. We don't. But I can assure you God does. He knows where the tribe of Levi is. He knows exactly where they are. <clears throat> He's preparing this world. And we're just sitting by idly and indifferent and complacent. These tribes are still in existence and God knows exactly where we are. Where they are. And when you read the Old Testament, 
The twelve tribes are prominent throughout. They are listed numerous times. They're not always listed in the same order, but they're listed. And as one scholar put it in the Old Testament list, sometimes the order of birth is followed. At other times, it's the order of Jacob's blessing upon them. At other times, the order of encampment, how they camped around the tabernacle, the order of the senses before they invaded Canaan, the order of the blessing and the cursing, the order of Moses' blessing. Now, don't lose me. Twelve tribes. But what is unusual in this last list in Revelation chapter 7, the names of Dan and Ephraim are omitted. And they are replaced by Levi and Joseph, who was the father of Ephraim. Why? Why would these two names be omitted? Well, do you know what Dan did after the kingdom split? They were involved deeply in idolatry. And they attempted to keep anybody from going back to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Same thing for Ephraim. No different from you and me today, folks. We have idols we make in our own mind and we serve those idols every day. Dan and Ephraim are not listed. They are replaced in this list by Joseph and Levi. And you can read that on your own. If you have a weakness for idolatry, and that, again, idolatry is something we can... Oh, well, let's picture somebody that goes over to Walmart and buys some modeling clay, and they'll sculpture a professional little figure and they put that figure on the mantle and they'll bow down before that figure every day, pray to that figure and worship that figure. We would say that's an idolatry. There's no difference in a Southern Baptist who goes home at night, lays in bed and creates a God of his or her own making in their mind, a God that will allow them to live by their own agenda and their own priorities. There's no difference. If there is idolatry involved in your life and my life, God can't trust us in ministry and service of things that you and I worship. Now this doesn't mean those tribes were cut off from salvation. They're, not, they're just not going to be God's witnesses in the tribulation period. Why are these 12 tribes, 12,000 out of 12, why are they sealed? Over in Revelation chapter 4. <coughs> Why did he pick these 12,000 out of each tribe? Revelation chapter 4 tells us because of their deep, moral, spiritual commitment to God. They had given themselves to the service of Yahweh. While the world is blaspheming and cursing God, Ever wonder why God doesn't use you? It's not that he can't want. But there's something between me and him that keeps us from being used by him. So he seals them. 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what's the result of all that? Go back to 24, 14. The gospel will be preached throughout all the world. Now listen to what John will say. In, after these things I look. After what things? After the 12,000 are sealed. Of the 144,000. 12,000 out of 25. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count. From every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying 
Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, Those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? Where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the, what's this? The great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's who they are. Can you imagine 144,000 Billy Grahams preaching the gospel in this tribulation period throughout the world? That's why there's an interlude here. Great multitude saved. Dr. John MacArthur puts it like this. From the Jewish people will come the greatest missionary force the world has ever known. Wow. 140,000. Behold. That's a word that calls attention. What's the result of these 144,000? A great multitude that no one can number. In fact, John doesn't give us the exact number, but it is indicated by the word behold. They have come from every nation, every tribe, and peoples and tongues. People from every race, every culture, every language. What an ingathering. What a picture of God's mercy and grace in the midst of his wrath. As they bear witness to the Messiah, the Savior of all who will trust him. Is this not what God promised Abraham? I will make you a blessing to the whole world. This is also fulfillment of Old Testament prophets, prophecy. In Isaiah 49, 6, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light to the nation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Isaiah 52, 10, The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see and the salvation may see the salvation of our God. And in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, Peter quoted this on the day of Pentecost. All this was fulfilled in the tribulation. Now watch this. Great crowd of people. Nobody can number them. And they're standing before the throne of God. And they're standing before the Lamb. And they're clothed in a white robe, the robe of righteousness, the robe of celebration. They're holding palm branches in their hands. That refers back to the Feast of Tabernacles in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. You remember when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the donkey? They were spreading the palm branches in front of them. Hosea, Hosanna, save, O God. And yet many of them standing there hollering that out did not recognize the Messiah that was headed to the cross to become their Savior. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me quote Dr. MacArthur again. The palm branches in the hands of these redeemed saints are a fitting Solemnative symbol of the unequal provision of salvation from the world. There will be a great multitude saved. And I'm going to have time to finish on Well, Let me make this very clear. Can't number them. They're going to wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now listen to me very carefully. If you're a member of a church, but you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a cultural Christian, you're depending on membership or depending on baptism or depending on good works or or giving to the church, but there never was a, a moment in time in your life when you acknowledged that you were a sinner and you repented of that sin, and you transferred your trust to Jesus and invited him into your life to be your Lord and Savior, 
you're going to be left behind, folks. Because the rapture is only for those who are in Christ and Christ in them. If you are left behind, oh, I'll just do that when I, if I'm left, I'll just, no, chances are you will not. Because you sat and sat and sat and sat and heard and heard and heard and heard and you've been so pardoned and crystallized in that indifference and that complacency. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that those who heard and heard and heard, these cultural <coughs> Christians will not be saved. They're not going to turn to God in that time. Salvation is now. Now. Those that will be saved in this tribulation will be those who have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel like you and me. Over and over and over until it just becomes commonplace. Oh, goodness. Great multitude. That's God's grace and mercy in the midst of all of His wrath. Don't presume on that. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus, doesn't matter that you belong to a church, doesn't matter you can say I've been baptized and, and you do a lot of good things. The only thing that has secured eternal life for you is the moment you recognized you were a sinner and you asked, you repented of that sin and asked God to forgive you and you invited Jesus Christ into your life. Now, isn't it sad that we are not doing what we should be doing now before the rapture, that we're not sharing Jesus with those that we come in contact with? Mm -hmm. I a little lady in my subdivision that I met before, she's, she's had two dogs since I've known where the snouser died, and the other one is a something, I'm not sure what that is, named Biscuit. I think they may go to university. And she's she's quite a little character. Biscuit. So the other day I, I ran up on them. And we, Biscuit didn't have anything to do with me. I mean, she was growling and barking and snarling. And it was sort of embarrassing the lady because she usually has spoken to me and talked to me. And finally, she came up to me and smelled my hand, and that was okay. And that just led to me being able to share a little bit more with this lady. She's a member of a particular denomination. But we got around to the heart of the matter. Doesn't matter about the label you're wearing. Church, denomination. What matters is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That you've invited him to come into your life. <coughs> you've accepted him as your Lord and your Savior. In the middle of everything we're going through, folks, we need to be about this business and we're not. I don't want to see people left behind. I, I don't want loved ones left behind. I don't want family members left behind. If you're here this morning and you've never ever repented of your sin, you've never asked Christ to come into your life, or you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him. I receive him. It's my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer and you're here in the auditorium, you need to come forward this morning and publicly confess that. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, let us know that you prayed that prayer. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Let me pray this prayer, and if you have not accepted Christ, and then David's going to lead us in a hymn of commitment. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. 
I accept him and I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. Is Debbie Legis, the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Would you say yes to him? Would you come? We continue our study in Daniel tonight, in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel facing corrupt politicians. So like America. But because he's that man of honesty and integrity, they'll convince the king to throw him into the lion's den. And you'll face that in your life if you walk that walk with consistency and integrity. And all. We'll look at that tonight. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, again for your word, for your Holy Spirit who enables us to understand it and then empowers us to obey it, to apply it for our daily life. I pray that even today you'd use us to be your witnesses. You'd bring us back tonight as we gather around your word. We honor you and exalt you and praise you in the strong name of Christ. We pray.